Hello, welcome to the Zepparella Learning Channel. And this is my three-part series on how to play John Bonham's drum parts in Kashmir. Uh, in the first video, I'm going to be talking about the groove and showing you how to play that. We're going to talk about polyrhythms. We're going to talk about the magic stuff that's going on in the hi-hat and the bass drum foot. And I'm also going to talk about what I use, uh, what visualization imagery I use in order to really settle into the groove. In the second video, I'm going to talk about the part that I call the bridge, which happens at 2 minutes 11 seconds in the recorded version of the song. And I'm also going to talk about how to really lock in with your guitarist and some tricks you can use to do that. In the third video, I'm going to talk about the chorus. I'm going to go through some of the really killer fills that Bonham does in the chorus. And I'm also going to talk about the way I have chosen to play the chorus live, which is different than the way Bonham did it. I'll kind of walk you through my thinking about the choices that I made there. I'm also going to speak about the structure of the song and some tips that I use to memorize parts in a song that's long and has the potential for forgetting where you are and a possible train wreck. Here at the Zepparella Learning Channel, we aim to bring you larger lessons that you can take with you, whether you're playing a Zeppelin or whether you're playing another song that you've written or of somebody else's. And in this series, my bigger lesson I'd like you to take away is uh, using visual imagery in order to deepen your feel, deepen the groove of a song. So thanks for watching and let's get started. So the brilliance of Led Zeppelin's songwriting is all here in Kashmir. And part of the brilliance of this song is that the guitar is playing in a three feel. Uh, there's some debate over whether it's 3-4 or 6-8, um, and please see Gretchen's video about that. I'm sure she'll go into depth about what the guitar is doing there. But Bonham is playing a relentless 4-4. Four, four. And what that means is that the drums feel very solid, while the melodies are sort of floating over the drums, and they never feel like they quite resolve with the drums. That's called a polymeter, where the ins two instruments are playing in different time signatures. The math of this kind of thing is one of the things I love the most about drumming. Um, I, when I first started drumming, I didn't realize how much I loved math. When I was in school, it wasn't my favorite subject. And, you know, uh, I think women of my era weren't encouraged that much in math. And uh, so I was under this impression that it was just something I wasn't good at. And when I started playing the drums, I realized, oh my gosh, I love calculations, and especially in music. And polymeters and polyrhythms are a really fascinating and fun way to expand your playing on the drums. I'm going to link below to a couple of uh, great YouTube tutorials that I found on these, uh, to this topic. Um, and I hope that you explore it a little bit more. Now the groove. So that as I was uh, getting ready to teach the song, there was some question all over the place about whether the 16th note bass drums on the 1 and the 3 are like in when the levee breaks, a result of um, a, uh, an echo or a delay, and that bottom is actually playing just a straight kick in the, on the one and the three, rather than those doubles. And um, in every notation that I've seen of this song, however, it is notated as uh, playing both of those 16th notes. I choose to play both of those 16th notes because I don't play live with a delay uh, or any kind of effect, so I want it to sound as much as I can like Kashmir. And also, I think that Bonham was playing those 16th notes, and I'll explain why I think that in just a little bit. But first, let me run through the basic groove of the song. Here we go.
So that seems like Rock 101. And if you've ever played an ACDC song, you know that sometimes simple isn't always the easiest. <laughs> and I'm going to show you some uh, subtleties about playing this very simple beat that goes on for a really long time in this song. Um, so the reason, going back to the reason that I think that Bonham Plick did play these kick drums rather than having it be an echo or delay. If you listen to the third beat in the third measure of the song, you will hear the kick drum with a tiny breath. The kick drums before that are going along and they're pretty stable there, right? And then in that one, he puts this tiny little space between those two kick drums. So it's not a 16th note, it's not an 8th note, it's, there's just a magical placement of it. If you listen to it over and over next to the one before and after, you can hear that there's just a little bit of space and that little breath there is this magic thing that makes the whole song settle. And it's not just the listener who, hear, who might subtly hear it, subconsciously hear it, it's not his bandmates who might subconsciously hear it because they will, they'll feel that little thing even if it's not audible to them even if they're not like oh that kick drum is just slightly placed differently it's also the biggest benefit is for the drummer because as you're playing the song this rhythm this is you know like i said rock 101 and it goes on for eight minutes of the song really i mean there's uh it's an eight minute song and uh beside the choruses and the little bit of bridge, it's really, this is what you're playing through the whole thing, through all of those descendings as well as the verses. So it can feel, um, it's a simple beat, you can kind of get into it, and the danger is that your mind might kind of drift away. And this has happened, I think, to the best of us, where we're on stage, we're in a two-hour set, we've got this moment, okay, this is a solid, easy, simple beat that I can play that goes on for a long time, and now I can think about who came to the show, and what's that guy doing over there on the stage, and oh, I really like that outfit that she's wearing tonight, and what's the next song, and all of these things, and then suddenly the beat is not as settled as it should be being focused, having intention with every beat while you're on stage is the goal. And it's unrealistic sometimes to think that that's always going to happen. But if you find that you've moved either forward in the beat um, and gotten a little, uh, the beats kind of run away from you, you don't feel like it's in that magic pocket, and you put that little space there, it'll bring you right back it'll bring you right back to where this groove is supposed to be, which is settled, which is feels behind, which feels like it's this plodding, walking, beautiful, breathing, circular beat. And that little space is so subtle, and yet play with that as you are practicing this, uh, this groove. Play with that little 16th note placement there and find the millions of places that that second kick, that second kick drum there, that second sixteenth note, find out where you can place that to make the song feel different. Okay, so that's the kick drum. Now let's talk about the hi-hat. The hi-hat in Kashmir has been a really interesting journey for me because when I listen very closely, the hi-hat most of the time during that groove is playing very evenly. And what I discovered in learning cashmere was that when I play, I tend to lift up my hi-hat my hi hand and bring it down harder with the snare. I think it's a mechanical thing. I think because my snare hand is lifting up, I think my hi-hat hand wants to come back and give it space. And so what that means is that there's always, I'm always playing with this, uh, this kind of pulse on the hi-hat 
rather than this very even uh, feel on the hi-hat. When I listen to this song, to me it sounds like the hi-hat is playing very, um, uh, like, very kind of on the beat, and the bass drum and the snare drum are playing behind, which is, wouldn't surprise me that Bonham could come up with that um, thing that I'm sure he didn't even realize he was doing, but it's just, you know, it's the mark of, you know, a maestro <laughs> to be able to do that kind of thing. For me, I really had to think about this. How do I get my hi-hat to play as evenly as possible while uh, the kick and the snare um, are hitting pretty solidly. I mean, this is not a, a, a soft song. That snare drum, I want it to really crack. How do I give it space? For a while, I was really um, working on cutting off that connection that I have with this, you know, lifting that is going on. So I was doing these kind of um, funny little uh, things where I was holding my arm kind of goofy like this as I was playing just in order to and then feeling my hand very softly um, hitting those hi-hats on the uh, hi-hat beats as I was playing so instinct is to go and so how do I get around that I, I was trying all of these goofy things and I was really aware of using like not lifting this arm the way I usually if you see me play I usually lift stuff higher than they need to be lifted and so I was playing with just moving my wrist with my uh, with my snare hand and not lifting my arm up. None of that was working for me and I still I wanted this to be even. So what I have started to do which sounds um, this is not something that Bonham did this is something that Clem does is I started to think about Ringo. I started to think about my visualization for the song in this kind of circular thing and there's a quote that Anna, our singer, often says uh, about how um, uh, she's telling the story of, of Robert Plant talking about how the song came up and one of the first things she says is, uh, so Bonham came in with this kind of shh, shh, shh sound. And so I was thinking about that sh 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 song. Like, what does that mean? What is he talking about? And I started to think about how Ringo plays his hi hat in a swish like that. He and I think that's because he's a left-handed drummer playing on a right-handed kit. But he does this back and forth movement. And when I started to do that playing cashmere, it all kind of came together for me so that I could play. exaggeratedly depending on how I'm feeling or how I want it to sound and you know I don't uh, I open the hi-hat just a little bit in a live setting I know Bonham didn't do that but uh, for me live I want a little bit more swish and so uh, with the hi-hat open it makes a little swishy sound so it could all be in my head but for some reason having that movement going back and forth really helps me get into the circular feeling of this song. So just a tip, just an idea, and mostly what I'm talking about is really messing with your mind in order to come up with a, being able to really settle into a groove. So that's what I want to talk about next, but first I want to go into that descending guitar line part. So Bottom plays the same thing that he plays in the verses in those descending lines, those ba ba ba, those transitional pieces that go uh, between the verses, that go uh, before the bridge, before the choruses. Um, 
he doesn't change what he's doing. I, and I think in the last one, he, he lets go of those double, uh, those 16th note kick drums. But in every other one, I always just play those. And I, the reason I do that is because I want that same feel to be moving all the way through. I don't want to, as I would in other songs, especially in songs I would write, I would try to make those transitions feel different. But I think it's really important in this song for it to, the, to feel the same, for it to continue to go so that when you come into those choruses, when you come into the bridge, it really does feel more like an explosion. And the way that you do that is you just keep that tension of that same beat going and going and going. So Robert Plant said about this song that what Bonham didn't play is what really made this song. And I think about that a lot when I think about the way that he uses the crash symbol in this song. You'll notice when you listen to the album version that there are very few crashes in the verses. Uh, there isn't a crash going back into the one after the first transitional um, walk down part. Uh, there isn't a crash going into the transition. And he's very spare. And what that creates on the album version is the mood. There isn't this like, okay, here we are into the next part. Okay, here we are into the next part. He holds it back. It's like what Plant said, like what he doesn't play is what kind of makes the song. It makes it spooky. It makes it moody. It makes it heavy. So in the transitions, there is a crash only, not going into them, but only on the four. There are four measures, and it only goes a, a crash on the one of the four measure and that crash is kind of a magical crash. Um, it's pretty necessary. I feel like everybody hears it. It's like the signal. Um, not where you expect it, but I feel like you kind of got to play that one. Um, if I miss that one, it, it just, it, everything feels wrong. <laughs> um, now I, live, I've chosen to play the crash on the first uh, beat of the transitional pieces and the reason I do that is because it really bums my band out if I don't do that <laughs> and uh, we've had conversations about it and I think that live I make some choices like that we all make choices like that because we're going um, we're playing Holly is playing a bass she's not playing a keyboard and a keyboard fills up space in a different kind of way uh, than a bass guitar does and so um, I feel like more cymbals, more crashes live, for me, makes a lot more sense. If I was going to do this exactly the way Bonham did, then I would not play as many crashes as I do. But um, I make the decision live to hit those crashes, and I think it, it holds up pretty well that way. But I just want you to notice what he does uh, and pay attention to where he doesn't play those crashes, where you expect him to play them and just notice how that affects the mood of the song. So finally what I want to talk about is what I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, video which was the bigger lesson to take with you and in these videos what I want to talk about is your imagination and your visual sense. So when I think about this groove, like I said, it's a long groove, you're playing the same thing, and, uh, and yet it's magical, and it has to be right, it has to feel settled, it has to feel pulled back, um, it, you just really have to feel like it's this circular kind of groove. So just because drums are really about math doesn't mean that you can't tell a story with your drum groove. And the way that I approach most of what I play is I have some kind of visualization that I do, some kind of little picture or story or image in my head in order to attach to my groove. Now I'll give you an example which is in the groove of cashmere. And I feel kind of dumb, in fact I feel really dumb because 
for some reason, I thought that in Kashmir, the place, it was desert, but it's not. It's in the Himalayas. <laughs> so who knew it's actually lush and beautiful and mountainy. So now my visualization makes absolutely no sense, but I'm going to stick to it because I think I still would have come up with this visualization, which is that I imagine walking through the desert, walking through sand when I'm in this. I actually, I imagine it being, um, you know, at after sunset, I imagine watch, walking through, it sounds to me like dusk, walking through the sand, and uh, part of the reason I do that is because the feel of it is like you're walking through sand. There's a rising and falling there's a feeling of being impeded just slightly, like it can't push forward, like there's, it's like plodding in a way. And then the, the vocal and the guitar line, um, the melodies of the song are like this beautiful swirling thing that's happening above, like the, the wind coming off of a desert. And so when I'm playing, I'm in the desert and, um, I actually, and I like think of like a beautiful band of Bedouins or camels or I have this whole thing that I do as I'm playing to keep me in this movement and it makes me, it makes me feel what I'm playing. It, it makes me feel like I'm telling a story as I'm playing and I would encourage you to play with your imagination. We have these imaginations in you know, and I know in our culture we tend to push away our imaginations a lot of the time and stick with reality, but you know, the imagination is a, a beautiful, beautiful thing and you're an artist, you're creating a picture and you're going to create a picture in rhythm. And so uh, that's my lesson for you in this first video and in this whole series is start to imagine what it is, what story you're telling. So that's my first video in my series on Led Zeppelin's Cashmere. In the second video, we're going to go, we're going to take it to the bridge. Uh, we're going to go to that part of the song that starts at 2 minutes, 11 seconds. And we're going to talk about uh, getting super tight with your guitarist. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.